Okay, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? So uh, I have to warn you ahead of time, and those who uh, didn't understand, this is going to be a more of an experimental type of talk. So you know, I apologize. I, I don't think I'm going to have any illustration of equations or any other <laughs> ways to attract more computational people. But still, uh, I'm going to talk about a recent work and. Uh, we are still working on motor control. We di still didn't see the light and move to decision making. But uh, what we are trying to do is we try to understand the uh, neural implementation of the, our ability to perform voluntary movements. And uh, the way people usually, the way people usually uh, envision this, or the way most of us usually envision this implementation, is a sequence uh, of events. Or, a serial of uh, a transformation that take place in the cortex, in the uh, posterior parietal cortex, a uh, premotor cortex, parietal cortex, that include uh, the transition from perception to coordinate transformation to action. And according, according to this view, according to this vision, the motor cortex is mostly about controlling the output, controlling spinal cord. So in the motor cortex, there is in some yet unclear manner there is uh, 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 the emergence of the appropriate motor command. And this command actually dictates or, or tr is transmitted downstream to the spinal cord and dictates the appropriate uh, activation of muscle uh, that are required for performing voluntary movement. However, this type of, of uh, uh, view of the uh, motor cortex as, as an output station that mostly controls spinal cord really ignore the rich infrastructure, the neural infrastructure, that includes a lot of subcortical input to the motor cortex. So we are talking about two major loops that are uh, actually projecting, that, uh, this is subcortical loops that project back to the motor cortex, and one of them is the cerebellum, and the other loop is the basal ganglia, and all, both these loops project back to the motor cortex. And we think that these loops actually have a very important role in the control of voluntary movement by, act, by looking at what happens when some deficit, some pathology affects this loop and information flow is impaired. So, for example, in basal ganglia, uh, pathologies of the basal ganglia, one of the most uh, famous pathologies is the Parkinson disease, which has the most major or the most prominent symptoms of Parkinson's disease are uh, deficits in motor uh, performances. But uh, other pathologies of the basal ganglia also involve pathologies in uh, motor ability like Tourette, like OCD. So we think that basal ganglia in its projection back to the motor cortex has a major impact on motor, corti on motor cortex and the control of voluntary movement. In parallel, the cerebellum also so, uh, pathologies of the cerebellum also are characterized by severe motor deficits. Now, <clears throat> both these structures are actually, uh, the way they project to the motor uh, cortex are relayed in the motor thalamus. So the motor thalamus in itself actually serves as a hub, as a very important hub for information, motor-related information from the cerebellum in the basal, and the basal ganglia on its way to the motor cortex. Now, if we look at the motor thalamus, this is a rather, uh, or in fact, if we look at the thalamus, this is a rather uh, complicated structure that contains many different uh, subdivisions, including the motor divisions shown here in green, and the thalamus in itself serves as a bottleneck for massive information that comes from relatively big structures, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, they all have to go through the, uh, through the motor thalamus, and in the motor thalamus there is a, an opportunities for further processing of this information, the transmitted information, in its way to the motor cortex. Now, if we look at the motor thalamus uh, itself, we can look oh. at the basal ganglia receiving area and the cerebellar receiving area of the oh. motor thalamus. The structure, the anatomy of the motor thalamus is rather complex. Basal ganglia projection terminates on uh, cell bodies in the, uh, in the basal ganglia receiving part of the motor thalamus, actually having inhibitory impact on these cells. And on the other hand, cerebellum 
also have projections that terminate on cell bodies in the mototalmus, but having an excitatory input. And finally, there are projections from layer six, that feedback projection from the motor cortex, layer six in the motor cortex, that are at terminating on the <coughs> distal dendrites of neurons in the mototalamus. So, and, and I, I don't even, just for sake of simplicity, I didn't even show here the interneurons that are in the mototalamus and the inhibitory reticular uh, nucleus that surrounds the intermotocalamus that actually allows for a for further processing of information, arriving information to the, motor, to the motor cortex can be further processed at the level, at the level of the motor thalamus. If we look how the motor thalamus sends information to the cortex, this is just an uh, illustration taken from the work of Shinoda. It's a tracing of a single thalamocortical fiber that terminates in patches that can extend several millimeters at the rostrocaudal uh, uh, aspect of the, uh, of the motor cortex. So in itself, even a single fiber is, can potentially recruit multiple targets in the motor cortex. So we have here a system that actually transmits information from two very important motor structures, the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, can process information further in the motor thalamus, and sense and activate large area of the motor cortex. Nevertheless, despite this, at least, uh, 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 potential of the system to modulate the motor command, we know very little about this pathway, about how information from basal ganglia and the cerebellum is being processed and affects targets in the motor cortex, and how it can actually modify the motor command. So, and this is really, what we were trying to understand. So what is the best approach to study this? So we use the anatomy of the system. And this is just uh, an MRI from, from people, from a person. And you can see here the cerebellum. The advantage of the cerebellum is that it is connected. The efferent fibers up from the cerebellum all travel through what is called the superior cerebellar peduncle. This is a bundle of fibers where all the efferent uh, fibers from the cerebellum are being projected, to, most of them to the motor thalamus. So, and this is shown here uh, in large. What we, are, what we are doing is we implanting, chronically implanting uh, primates with stimulating electrode in the peduncle. And this electrode, this stimula stimulating electrode has two, um, roles. Uh, first, we can use stimulation in this electrode to identify neurons that are part of the pathway, and then to study what is their unique contribution to voluntary movement. We can also use this electrode, this stimulating electrode, for actually altering the flow of information in this pathway. So to do so, what we did is we took we trained primates. Uh, this is work that was done by uh, uh, Oren, Efrat, and Rea, that they trained uh, uh, three monkeys to perform uh, a voluntary uh, delayed response paradigm. The monkey was actually just generating torque at the wrist, so it's a single joint, and he received uh, a cue that uh, told him, this is gonna be the target that you will have to attend very soon. There was a delay period, and then the monkey had to generate the appropriate, uh, or to, to produce the appropriate torque that will shift the cursor from the center uh, target to the peripheral target. At the same time, we, I mean, in these monkeys, we also implanted them with a uh, chronic electrode in the superior cerebellar peduncle, and we recorded activity in mototalamus and from multiple areas, multiple sites in the motor cortex and use this, uh, this electrode for stimulation and activating the pathway. So the first question was, how, uh, what is the, the projection pattern of the uh, cerebellar thalamocortical pathway in the motor cortex? And this is just with stimulating the peduncle, inform uh, information flows for, uh, from the thalamus through the thalamus and we record from the motor cortex. This is just examples of single unit recording, several traces, and if we repeat this stimulation enough times, about uh, 200 times in each site, we see that, in fact, 
single pulse stimulation, so a very, very brief stimulation in the peduncle, produce a very robust response in the motor cortex. And the characteristics of this response is early excitation followed by a prolonged inhibitory phase and then period of early excitation. So we actually map these projections. We found here, uh, this is just mapping across the cortical depth. And what we found is that, in fact, the earliest response to this stimulation is, can be found in deep, uh, area, deep layers of the motor cortex. These are the output layers of the motor cortex, which means that the uh, cerebellar thalamocortical pathway has an access to the output layer of the motor cortex and can thus modulate the impact the motor cortex has on working muscles. We also looked for the uh, spatial or the surface location of these termination patterns. And what you see here, uh, this is just an uh, example from one monkey. This is the central sulcus. This is the arcuate sulcus here near the sulcus in the rostral part is the primary motor cortex and more anterior is the premotor cortex. And what I'll show you now is a movie that actually depicts the activation, the response to a single pulse stimulation across the motor cortex. This is taken from deep layers and this is taken from superficial layers and what you'll see here are the time scales. And red means excit excitation and blue means inhibition and what you can see here is that in response to a single pulse stimulation, there, is a brief there was a brief excitation in M1 that was followed by a very long phase of inhibition in M1 that persisted for several tens of milliseconds. And in fact, the, the wave of excitation traveled from M1 to premotor, but the, there was a, a, the later phase of re-excitation traveled on the other direction. So that the inhibition or the excitation started earlier in primary motor cortex, but the inhibition was longer in motor cortex, which can actually control the travel the, or the direction of this traveling wave. So we f what, we, what we saw and what, what we understood is that the inhibition is in fact the most prominent or the uh, possible, I, I, or better yet, the, the most dominant aspect of this response, of the response of the motor cortex to um, single pulse stimulation. But not, not only that the inhibition was longer than the excitation, it was very sensitive to the exact epoch in which the stimulation occurred. So what you see here is recording from the same site, the response of a single cortical site to stimulation here, the, sti the stimulation was applied when the monkey performed the task, and you see a moderate inhibition in following the excitation, but as soon as the monkey is st stopped working, the monkey is idle, and we are just letting, uh, we are recording spontaneous activity, the response to the same stimulation actually changes, and the change is not in the excitation that re remains roughly the same, but the duration and the depth of the inhibition. And you, this is just quantification showing that the excitation phase of the response is unaffected by the epoch at which it was applied, but the inhibition was very sensitive. And in fact, you can see, you can see it better when we record a local field potential. So this is the average local field potential or the field response to stimulation sorted by different epochs. And the early phase is not very affected whether stimulation were applied during movement, during rest, or when the monkey was completely idle. However, the late response, which corresponds to the, inhib to the inhibitory phase, was extremely sensitive. And we get very strong response during spontaneous activity when the monkey is idle, we get very little response during movement or during the delay period when the monkey is preparing for movement. And we get intermediate response during intertrial interval or before the monkey knows about the nature of the movement it needs to perform. Which means that we have here a very pronounced inhibition 
that is triggered by a single pulse uh, stimulation of the pathways, but the inhibition is not constant. It's very affected by the exact behavioral epoch or the motor context in which the motor cortex is situated at a specific point in time. So this actually brought the, the question, what is the source of this inhibition? Now, in sensory areas, people have shown that a single thalamic fiber, thalamocortical fibers, affect both pyramidal and fast spiking inhibitory interneurons. So it is not that information only goes to the pyramidal excitatory cells, it, it affects both excitatory and inhibitory cells. However, the synaptic contact that the single thalamic, thalamocortical fiber makes on inhibitory cells is much stronger compared to the synaptic contact it makes on the excitatory cells. And the, the, it was estimated that the synaptic efficacy of this contact is about five times larger than the efficacy of that contact. And the reason is because of the postsynaptic uh, or the receptors at the postsynaptic membrane. This is, in both cases, this is AMPA receptors. However, on inhibitory cells, the AMPA receptors, it, missing one of the uh, subcomponent, the R2 component, and because of that, this synapse actually is permeable to calcium, which makes it more effective. But in practice, for us, for us what it means is that the synaptic contact of a single thalamic cortical fibers is stronger, specifically stronger, on inhibitory cells. Now, this was shown in rodents and the sensory system. And the question is whether the same mechanism also applies for the motor system in primates. So we have ah, just one point. I mean, this synaptic contact, I'm sorry, this synaptic contact can be actually blocked by specific toxin that is uh, secreted by the Euro spider. This is just, we will use this information later on. So the question we wanted to see whether this type of uh, a, a circuitry is also valid or exists in the motor cortex of primate. So we have indirect evidence that this is indeed the case. So first, we found that there are different types of response pattern of single cell to stimulation of the pathways. Some cells have a very, very powerful response to the same stimulation compared to other cells that have a much weaker, more variable response to the stimulation. Now, if we look at the shape of the action potential, you can see that all these cells that had very strong response to the stimulation had a narrow action potential. And while cells with a moderate response or weak response had a broad action potential. And just in general, we found a negative correlation between the response gain of single cells and the shape of the action potential. Now, people tend to, or people assume that neurons, cortical neurons with narrow action potential are inhibitory. But yet this is indirect and probably not precise a way to classify cells. So in order to verify that indeed we have uh, inhibitory cells in the motor cortex that are strongly or more strongly activated compared to excitatory cells, we use the, uh, struct the unique structure of these um, synapses, the, the, synap the thalamic synapses on inhibitory cells, and we actually applied using ionophoresis the urotoxin that I uh, showed you before on these synapses. And what we found is that indeed, if we have broad cells and narrow cells, both of them responding to the uh, SCP stimulation, to the activation of the pathways, once we inject the toxin, only the uh, response of the narrow cells is abolished, while the response to the same stimulation of the broad cells is in fact remains intact and in some cases it actually becomes larger. After we stop the injection, we wait a little bit and the response returns back to baseline. So this suggests that indeed the inhibitory or the narrow uh, 
cells that responded to the SCP stimulation with narrow action potential are indeed inhibitory cells, while the cells with broad action potential that responded to the stimulation are in fact excitatory cells. Okay, so it means, or our conclusion was that indeed the same structure of feed-forward inhibition that was shown in rodents also applies for the motor cortex in primates. That is that a, sin that a, a, a thalamocortical axon that projects to the motor cortex affects both interneurons, inhibitory interneurons, and pyramidal cells, but the efficacy of this synaptic contact is much stronger. And this actually brings out the question, why, why, why do we need this type of arrangement? If we want to transmit information, why to have uh, the same fiber affect both inhibitory and excitatory cells? Why not just to transmit information via activation of excitatory cells? So in, the, in sensory areas, it was suggested that this arrangement of feed-forward uh, inhibition of excitation and inhibition that are actually very uh, uh, tightly coupled makes cortical neurons, and in this example, this is cells in the auditory cortex, make them very sensitive to transient activation or to transient flow of information in the pathways. So what we kind of used this as a sort of a working hypothesis and tested what are the functional implications of the uh, input information flow from the cerebellum to, via the thalamus to the motor cortex on the activity of cells in the primary motor cortex during movement. And we not only just used the broad uh, term cells, we looked for the activity of identified neurons. So what we did is we looked at uh, neurons that were recorded simultaneously and in this case, and you can see here in green and orange dots, these are examples of two cells that were recorded simultaneously that both of them were actually responsive to the stimulation. That means that both of them integrated information from the cerebellum. And then we looked at the activity of these cells now when the monkey performed the task. And what you see here is just a raster plot of these cells, the way they are, uh, uh, they fire around movement onset at time zero, and the trials are sorted according to the direction of movement. And we found that if we look around movement onset, these two specific cells, this example, the cells have a, a positive covariation of rate. What is called the noise correlation of these two cells was positive. When this cell fire above average, also this cell fired above average, and so on and so on. So there was a trial to trial covariation of rate. Then we compute what is the noise, the average noise correlation across pairs of identified cells. And we found, and this is shown here, that when two cells are both excited by the pathway, both of them are integrating information from the thalamus, they tend to have a positive noise correlation or covariation of, of rate just around movement onset. This is just the z-score. And when we take cells that were either both inhibited by the pathway, or one of them was excited and one of them was inhibited, the two cells actually had a negative noise correlation. That, this suggests that, in fact, the thalamocortical input can, is sufficiently strong in order to synchronize cells, motocortical cells, in a transient ma manner around movement onset. The other finding that we found about the unique uh, uh, properties of cells that integrate this thalamic input is the timing of action. So again, these are two cells recorded simultaneously. One of them shown here around movement onset. The blue cell actually had a narrow action potential, and that is the presumed inhibitory cells, while the red cell had a broad action potential, that means presumably an excitatory cell. What we found is that in this example, the task-related activity of the inhibitory cells preceded the activity of the excitatory cells. And on average, when we look at identified cells, okay, so we don't have that many, but 
um, across identified cells, cells with narrow action potential, presumably inhibitory cells, their task-related activity started earlier compared to the excitatory cells. Okay? So we suggest that, in fact, the thalamic volley that projects to the, or arrives to the motor cortex around movement onset actually synchronizes cells or receiving cells in the motor cortex at movement onset and actually dictates a rather peculiar timing of events where inhibitory cells are actually a bit earlier or starts firing a bit earlier than excitatory cells. Now the question is of course whether at all the task related activity of the motor thalamus can support this type of uh, 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 impact on the motor cortex. And to do so, what we did is we actually recorded in the motor thalamus simultaneously and the motor cortex. And this is an example of motor. It's very kind of peculiar here. I mean, oh, to stand here and to, not to see what I'm showing. But, uh, this is uh, an example of a cell single unit from the motor thalamus. This is an example of a motor cortical cells, and you can see that the motor, the motor thalamic activity is, precedes the cortical activity a little bit. And if we average it, this is just a, a PSTH of these, a superposition of the two PSTHs of these cells. And again, if you look at the average, the thalamic task-related activity starts before motor cortical activity and even uh, kind of in, in addition what we found is that the lamic input actually can act to synchronize motor cortical input. Here what you see is the correlation between cortical cells triggered on the stimulation time and you can see that there is an onset or there is an epoch of synchronized activity due to the stimulation, but even if we trigger cortical synchrony on thalamic firing as shown here, we can see that there is enhancement. The thalamic input to the motor cortex enhances motor cortical synchrony, especially for sight with matching somatotopic arrangement. That is, areas, uh, proximal sites or si in the motor thalamus will synchronize mostly proximal sites in the motor cortex. And proximal distal, I'm talking about hand-related uh, 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 areas. So what I showed you is that the cerebellothalamocortical pathway actually provides a, a, a signal to the motor cortex that both synchron synchronizes uh, activity but also generate excitation inhibition uh, uh, impact. Now, how much of the, what is the actually the causal role of the motor thalamus in the observed motor behavior and motor cortical activity? In order to do so, what we wanted to do is to block the flow of information in the pathway. So again, we used the stimulating electrode that we had in the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle and we train, we, while the monkey performed the task, we applied high frequency stimulation. High frequency, I'm talking about 130, 150 hertz of stimuli that were applied persistently for minutes while the monkey performed the task so we could measure the motor behavior. And at the same time, we were able to measure the activity of motor cortical cells during this manipulation. And you know, I know I'm not talking to necessarily a, experimental crowd, but still, just for uh, sake of, of clarity, the little uh, uh, blips here are the stimulation artifacts, and the large events are the spikes. So we are able, despite this continuous stimulation, we are able to identify the activity, the task-related activity of the recorded cells. So the first question is, how this persistent stimulation affect the motor behavior? So what you see here is the radial torque, the radial wrist torque produced by the monkey during control trials. The time zero is the go signal, and green dots are shown for each trial showing the exact movement onset. We start applying the stimulation. The immediate effect 
is the increase in the reaction time. You can see that the green dots actually shifted to the right. Reaction time becomes longer. Movement time is also affected. It's difficult exactly to estimate how much it is affected. We mostly saw increase in the variability of movement time. Then, uh, after stopping the stimulation within few trials, the monkey re returns back to normal performances in terms of uh, reaction time and movement time. So, if we look at the average response, during control trials shown here in blue, there is a rapid reaction time and fairly stereotyped movement. However, during this persistent stimulation, reaction time increase, movement time becomes more variable. And this actually, this figure is very similar to what is shown in the kind of textbook. This is taken from Candel and Schwartz. You can see here, this is shown for ataxic people, the, the characteristic of cerebellar ataxia, cases where the cerebellum is uh, malfunction, doesn't operate, doesn't provide the right uh, uh, information, is increasing reaction time, poor, poorly performed movements. So we think that using this persistent stimulation, we have a good model for cerebral ataxia. But the advantage that we have here is we can also ask what happened to the activity of single neurons at this time. So the first question is, what is this stimulation doing to the activity of cells. Now this is an example of a single cell. This is shown several traces, about 30 traces, of the response of the cell to single pulse stimulation. This is low frequency, three hertz stimulation. You can see that the cell very well respond to this stimulation. This is the average response, and this is just focusing at the short time being. You can see a very nice, robust response of this motocortical cell to the stimulation. Now, we shifted to high frequency stimulation, and this is shown here. Okay, so of course we have a lot of, we have many traces. I'm showing you several examples, 40 milliseconds each of these traces. These, okay, the red lines actually show the stimulation time. You can see here, the cell does not respond to the stimulation. And the reason is, of course, that synaptic contacts cannot follow high frequency stimulation, okay? So the cell stopped responding. Now what happened to the task-related activity of these cells? And you can see it here. This is just an example of a cell during normal uh, control trials. This is, again, each, of the, if each block shows the activity when the monkey moved to a specific direction. There are eight directions. Time zero is movement onset, and you can see the PSTH. There is a very pronounced transient response of this cell, and this cell is highly directional. Now we start the high frequency stimulation. This is the activity of the same cell during this stimulation. The main impact is the loss of this transient response at movement onset. But what is unaffected is the spatial tuning of the cell. So the directional tuning of the cell is maintained, but the response profile is greatly affected. And when we look at all the cells that we had, we actually quantify how phasic versus tonic these cells are. And we found that during control trials, the cells tend, the, this index tends to have higher values. That means more phasic response compared to high frequency stimulation trials. However, if we compare the change in preferred direction of these cells during high frequency stimulation versus control trials, we can see that the tuning of the cell is unaffected, okay? So the cells, the, the input, the thalamocortical input has impact on the response profiles, but not on the tuning of these cells, and its main impact is during onset of movement. So, and we think that this, the thalamic induced excitation inhibition interplay in the motor cortex is responsible for the transient onset of firing at movement onset, and in this manner, it dictates timing of action. Okay, so I would like to summarize here with um, a three points, kind of take home message that I think, and I, I will try to give some, uh, not a model, but some intuitive framework to think about these results, even though I, when I'm, when I'm talking about models, I'm talking in very, very uh, 
descriptive manner. So what, is, what, what, I want to, what I want to show you today are three things. The first is that using this approach by activating a specific pathway, we, we think that we can dissect motor cortical activity. And in primate research, the main problem is that we often don't know the cells we record from. We are just, you know, we have this forest of cells, they are all identical. We take some statistical approach, we say, okay, we, these are all the same, you know, it's, it's a homogeneous population of cells. However, by using this stimulation paradigm, and especially if you can actually combine it with ionophoresis and specific blockage of this, uh, uh, of, pa of uh, information uh, transfer, I think we can actually assign identity to the cell we record from. Now, of we, can we can say which cell integrate what type of information, which cells are excitatory and which cell are inhibitory. I think this is a very important step in actually advancing primate research. And of course, we are not here yet, right? I mean, so this is taken from, uh, as far as I remember, motocortex in, in, in mice, where every cell type is identified and labeled. However, I think that our uh, crude method of identification together with the very controlled behavior can actually provide a very powerful scheme for understanding motor cortical activity during normal voluntary movement. The second point that I, I want to, uh, I, kind of, I want, as a, uh, I want you to take from this, uh, from this talk, is that actually this thalamocortical induced excitation inhibition interplay dictates motor timing and it's in a manner that is not necessarily explicit. And what do I mean by that? If I look at the activity in red here of motor cortex without thalamic uh, input, it tends to be sluggish and slow. But the main impact of this excitatory volley that is followed immediately by a very strong inhibition is actually make cortical activity more transient. And in this manner, this interplay between excitation that is followed by even stronger inhibition, actually the, the mototalamus permits a very narrow window of opportunities for movement-related activity to evolve. So there is always a question whether the cerebellum, cerebellum dictates timing or not. So the way I see it, I mean, cerebellum is involved in timing just by construction. The arrangement of this circuitry actually naturally yields this timing control mechanism. And the last point that I want to uh, mention you, and this is kind of for me, it's uh, the, the least intuitive, is it is not clear to me, it was not clear to me when, when, when I got the results for, from the student, it was not clear why would you have to, a system where inhibitory cells are being recruited before excitatory cells. This makes no sense. I mean, we want to transmit information why to have uh, um, inhibition comes before excitation? Now, for this to kind of the intuition that I have to explain this, actually uh, uh, draw from my uh, experience at teaching medical students, okay? So, you know, medical students are, this is a huge crowd, very noisy. And, you know, there is this, all this ongoing noise there. And once in a while, someone wants to ask a question. So it's impossible, right? I cannot really understand anything. So the first thing I do is say, okay, now quiet everybody, and you're gonna ask, okay? So you're gonna ask a question, right? So this is actually a way for us to enhance signal to noise ratio. So we have in the motor cortex, there is a convergence of multiple pathways. Each one from, from pre-motor cortex, from sensory areas, from basal ganglia, from other different parts of the brain. Now, when, thalamic, when the thalamic waves actually arrives, it's a mess there. And in a way, we generate this inhibition, fast inhibition, and on top of it, excitation of the relevant, of the specific circuitry that is required for this movement is actually easier to achieve. And just as a hint that this might be the case, this is just an example of the task of the response profile of uh, neurons in 
motor cortex in blue and premotor cortex in red. And you can see that in, premotor, sorry, in primary motor cortex, the early phase, just before activity starts to evolve, there is a decrease, there is a sort of a, a small inhibition during this period that precedes the wave of excitation that follows. So this is, again, this is completely hand-waving explanation that I'm happy to hear how bad it is or to criticize me in any way. So I'll just thank all the uh, grant agencies, and of course I will uh, finish with the, this blessing next year in Jerusalem and maybe in the new building of uh, the Center for the uh, Edmund and Lee Safra Center for Brain Research. Thank you. <laughs>